Today is Thursday, May 26, 2016. I'm interviewing Joe Riley, the administrator for the National Agricultural Statistics Service, or NAS. I am Susan Fugate. I'm head of special collections at the USDA's National Agricultural Library and have been an employee of the U.S. Department of Agriculture for over 39 years. We're in the studios of USDA's Creative Media and Broadcast Center in Washington, D.C. Joe, would you state your name and spell your first and last name, please? Yes, thank you. My name is Joe Riley. That's J-O-E-R-E-I-L-L-Y. Good. I'd like you to start with um, giving us a brief, a brief um, biographical sketch of your life and your work. Okay. Well, originally I'm uh, from Pennsylvania. I grew up on a very small farm up in the northeastern part of Pennsylvania, up around Tamaqua, if anybody knows where that is. Uh, I attended uh, Penn State University, and from graduation from Penn State University, started off my career. I worked in Florida for a year or so for a large uh, banking financial system down there and then began my federal career back in 1975 with the United States Bureau of the Census. I worked with the uh, Bureau of the Census for 22 years uh, and was heading up the Census of Agriculture program at the Bureau of the Census at the time of its transition from the Department of Commerce Bureau of the Census over to USDA to the National Agricultural Statistics Service. And I have worked in various uh, positions of leadership at NAS during that time. Uh, I was over field operations for several years, served as the associate administrator of NAS for uh, uh, several years, and for the last two years have served as the administrator. Thank you. Please tell us how you came to be appointed as the administrator of NAS. Well, when you look back, uh, some of it is good old-fashioned hard work, and, and some of it is being in the right place at the right time. Uh, I really credit a lot of my preparation of being able to be selected as the administrator of having to deal with the Census of Agriculture. I was heading up that program over at the Department of Commerce Bureau of the Census. As you know, the Census is the largest data collection program involving agricultural statistics in our nation. And Back in 1996, uh, uh, heading up that program, came up with a, uh, a proposal to change the definition of what a farm was. And the current definition of a farm is any place that produces or sells $1,000 of agricultural products during the course of the given year. And uh, initiated a federal register notice that talked about changing that definition from $1,000 to $10,000. And at that time, that would have eliminated about half of the farms in our country. And so that started the political process and work of looking at the impact of that. And it was kind of a, uh, an interesting part of, of looking at uh, where certain programs should be and how they best serve their clients. But it really had a direct impact to agriculture of maintaining the, the, the current definition of a farm. And at that time, uh, Senator Burr uh, was very active and did not want to look at eliminating 85% of the farms in the state of West Virginia and was very influential on appropriations committee. And in about a month's time, uh, the program was transferred out of the Department of Commerce Bureau of the Census over to USDA NAS, and, and that was back in 1996, 1997. Uh, and I think of heading that program and sort of integrating it into NAS and seeing how fundamentally it became the core of developing the, the list of, of farm business operations across the country and seeing how it's used to develop all the sampling frames that are used to do whatever survey that NAS does put me in a great position to understand the statistical side, and I was able to bring in sort of an experience from another statistical agency to make sure that it was properly integrated into the programs here at USDA. And I think sort of being at the right place at the right time 
and having a leadership role in that uh, enabled me to get the right skills and abilities so that when the previous administrator, uh, Dr. Cynthia Clark, left you know, two years ago, I was in a key position to move up because I have been in a, a various leadership position for the last 20 years. Share with us some of the challenging issues you faced um, as administrator and other leadership roles in NAS, and um, talk about some of your strategies for moving NAS forward. Okay. Well, I think over the last, uh, starting back in about 2008, one of the th things that NAS, as many other federal agencies had to deal with, was sort of constricting or flat budgets. Uh, just recently, last week, we got uh, our 2017 fiscal mark from the Senate. And if I look at that dollar amount uh, for the uh, expected appropriations for the agency, we are about at the same dollar level that we were back in 2008. So now you have the task of figuring it out how to deliver the same programs, the same statistical data that the country relies on at the same budget for about the last eight years. So we had to do a very uh, detailed, you know, respective search of how could we find efficiencies. And I think the biggest thing that we looked at is that NASA at that time basically had an office and a staff in each one of the 50 states across the country. And looking at the infrastructure of supporting that and then looking at how we could integrate new technologies that did not exist before to see if we could change that fundamental structure. So we started back in 2010 on the endeavor of, okay, we have to make the tough call. We have to move from basically 50 offices and we're going to a regional approach. And uh, so we had a look at which offices we were going to, and I'll use the word close, because you know, you could say whatever it is, but you know, we were closing offices and moving staff, and we had to identify which offices and how, what the regional configuration was going to be. So that required us not only, uh, I had to go out and meet with each one of the directors, secretaries, or commission of agriculture from each one of the states, talk about what we were doing, negotiate with them as to uh, uh, what we saw was our proposed plan of doing this uh, restructuring. And we completed that, and it was kind of an interesting thing because you could talk a, a nexus of, of a couple things coming together at the same time like a perfect storm, but the time that we were to implement the restructure and move all the people around was uh, October 1st of 2013, which is at the same time, we went through the several week government shutdown. So we had people who were literally supposed to move and be in their new location the beginning of that fiscal year, and at the same time, the government was shut down. So uh, it was kind of an interesting time of working through the, the, the people part of it. There was people that were on, uh, their household goods were on moving trucks. Uh, they didn't know where they were supposed to report, what to do. There was no communication here, so uh, you know, even though at that time we weren't supposed to, I was very active at home on the cell phones with a lot of people trying to get them through this process. So we, we had to change our structure, so we went from an agency of about 1,100 people. Uh, we are currently down to around 930, uh, and that has been able to us to operate and deliver our same statistical program you know, more effectively. Now, we also had to incorporate some new technology. Uh, one thing is, uh, instead of doing things 50 different ways, you know, and all the inefficiencies doing that, we're trying to standardize things. I'd like to tell you that we're doing them, you know, one way, but at least we're down to at least 12 different ways. So that added a lot of efficiencies to the process. So when you develop a questionnaire, you want to do something, you didn't have a separate procedure for how you were measuring something in Indiana versus Iowa versus Texas. We're now doing things in a more standard fashion. And I think one of the biggest changes we were able to make was the introduction, or introduction of uh, iPads or you know, those small tablet devices into our data collection activities. 
So we have around 2,500 field enumerators that go around to all the farmers and ranchers on an ongoing basis. And they used to come out with paper questionnaires, you know, ask you all kind of questions that had to go back to a, a central site, you know, to be keyed in and, and process that. Well, right now we are capturing all of that electronically using iPads at the point of interview. So we've eliminated printing uh, paper questionnaires, mailing paper questionnaires. Uh, we've reduced the time, you know, for a lot of the data collection. We've improved the quality of the data. And that probably efficiency has enabled us to continue to produce our statistical uh, data requirements, even with the reduction of staff. So that was probably our biggest challenge of trying to figure out how we were going to deal with, uh, you know, this sort of level budget. Now, these efficiencies only take you so far, you know, I, and I look ahead in the future and trying to figure out, you know, where we would go from here. Uh, we've been able to keep up with things, but in still one point in time, I will say that the uh, business of gathering information and gathering data is getting more complex and more costly each year. So something will have to look at, 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 at changing in the future. Uh, if we're going to be able to fulfill our mission with sort of equal or less resources than we have right now. Um, talk about a program or a project that taught you something you did not expect and share some details with us. Okay, well, it, it, it's kind of interesting in uh, working with uh, agriculture and especially with the National Agricultural Statistics Service. I've been with the agency now 20 years. Uh, as you know, we provide key information on how much corn is grown in the country, cattle, everything that allows the economic system to work properly. And we're used a lot to determine whether people uh, can get uh, 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 crop insurance payments or uh, commodity uh, risk coverage payments and things like that. But looking at how agriculture has changed, and I've used this story quite a bit over the last couple years, is that, you know, everybody still thinks of agriculture as corn, soybeans, uh, cattle, hogs. And in growing up in, in our organization, if you wanted to get ahead, you wanted to be the statistician that focused on corn, that focused on cattle, or focused on, so on soybeans. Well, interesting enough, over the uh, last couple years, one of the major issues facing our country is what is happening to the bees that are out there needed for pollination. And if you start looking at things, and uh, you may think being able to measure an, uh, corn production or count cattle or hogs is a, a difficult task. And I say this, you know, I, I laugh to myself most of the time. Try counting bees, okay? That is a task in itself. We had to get new groups of people together. Uh, it's interesting that uh, bees and, and how they're used in pollination, they move all around the country. They are in convoys of tractor trailers that move all around the country. And trying to figure out how to count them, measure them, know where they're at at a given time because without bees, we won't have food in the future. And we started this program about two years ago and uh, I look back on my, you know, growing up on a farm in Pennsylvania and all the time I've spent in dealing with agriculture and it's like, I'm now learning about bees and how they work. It's something I never thought, you know, growing up on a small farm that I'd ever deal with or how important that they are. And, uh, why I bring that up as a story is that agriculture continually changes. Things that we are dealing with now are new, they're interesting, and they're important. And it shows how complex, you know, our system is for, uh, for producing the food and, agri uh, and fiber in this country is. And just working on this project for the last couple of years, I'm dealing with things now that I never even knew about a couple years ago, and I find that very exhilarating and challenging, and our staff really likes getting involved in new activities like that. Now, the next thing coming up is looking at uh, uh, microbes. It, we have uh, programs on antimicrobial resistance 
and how they're going to measure, and that'll be a challenge that we'll be looking at measuring uh, in the next couple years. Great. Dr. Catherine Wotecki, Undersecretary for Research, Education, and Economics, often explains in her public statements that having a statistical service with the U.S. Department of Agriculture is an important element in making sound policy decisions based on reliable data. Will you tell us details of a specific time or two that illustrates NASA's role in policy decisions? Well, I think that uh, uh, every month I can illustrate the, the role. We put out a monthly uh, crop report that measures uh, how much corn, soybeans, and that is being produced in this country. Uh, we do that under lockup conditions. If you ever have the opportunity, our staff comes in in the middle of the night we literally lock them up, you know, we close them in an office, we seal the windows, we seal the doors, we cut off the telephones, we cut off the computer systems, and uh, we look at measuring, you know, what is going to be available in the food supply for the coming season or cycle. And it directly impacts the market. Everything is driven off it. It sets the price of corn, soybeans, cattle, you know, depending on what we're putting out at that time. And what is exciting about many of our young statisticians that come in for uh, work is that they realize almost right away the importance of what their job is. Because if they don't do their job correctly and accurately, they see the direct impact back to the farmer. Uh, looking at just a big change that has come to our organization it has occurred just since the 2014 uh, Farm Bill that was put in place, which introduced the Agricultural Risk Coverage Program and the Price Loss Coverage Program. These are two safety net programs that are out there to farmers that in case of a catastrophic event uh, could be a flood, could be, you know, drought, the opposite end of it, hurricane, things like that. They, they lose their, their, their uh, crop or for that particular year. How should they be compensated? Also, it helps them to protect themselves by price loss or revenue loss because of market fluctuations. So this is looking at providing this type of coverage to all the farmers and ranchers out there and we now at NAS are looking at providing I'll call them county level estimates. Uh, there's 3,100 counties roughly around the country. Uh, there's about 30 different commodities that are in this program and based on the work that we do on an annual basis we have to be able to measure the production and yield for those commodities county by county across the country so that if the farmer wants to go and apply for some type of relief or loss coverage payment, they have to compare themselves to the data that is reflective of the average of the production in that particular county. And so all of our staff now see directly of how this impacts farmers and ranchers out there because if they've had a drought, and need to get some type of relief or a payment, they have to use our data to show how they were impacted. So instead of having a system that was based on, well, when you have an event, everything's a disaster, everything is lost, we now have scientific or, or sound statistical data to be able to prove and to document what really the farmer or rancher has lost in a particular situation. And all of our staff are very involved in that program and it really illustrates the key work that we do uh, and how the cycle of collecting the data from the farmer of what they report to us, us using good sound methodology and bringing it all together, producing these numbers for each county so that at the end of the year, if a farmer needs to apply for some type of program, they have the data to be able to document their loss. In 1997, you were awarded the Department of Commerce's highest honor for your work on the Census of Agriculture. The Census is a very important part of your legacy in all of your positions at NAS. Can you, you've described it to um, some level of detail, but can you describe the Census and how it has changed and grown over the years and what you'd like to see uh, in the future? 
Well, the census of agriculture, as I talked about a little bit earlier, is the largest data collection activity dealing with agriculture that we do in this country. Uh, uh, literally every five years, those ending in two and seven, we try to measure and document what's going on on each farm and ranch across the country, of which there's about 2.1 million farms now. Uh, and why it's important and why I've, I've enjoyed dealing with it, and it shows a little bit of the evolution of our country and our statistical system, is that when I was back at uh, the Department of Commerce, uh, Bureau of the Census, and I was dealing with the Census of Agriculture, uh, the census we were in with all the other areas of the economy. So I was in a section, I was over agriculture, but there was another division that was over manufacturing, there was another division that was over construction industries, the service industries, things like that, which develop uh, all of our GDP figures for the country. Agriculture represents only about one and a half or two percent of our GDP. And you think, well, geez, in a generalized statistical agency, the other 98 percent of the programs got a lot of the attention. And when we looked at, as I told you before, of looking at changing the farm definition from the 1,000 level to the 10,000 level, it was in an effort of trying to sort of save data collection costs. But it didn't really take into account how critical it was for administering all the programs that exist within the Department of Agriculture. So I actually think it was a fantastic move of moving the Census of Agriculture out of the Bureau of the Census into the Department of Agriculture. 90% uh, of the work that I've been able to do over the last 20 years is providing data that supports the Farm Service Agency or the risk management agency, or uh, uh, the uh, agricultural marketing service. All the agencies and programs within USDA, and you work closer there to making sure that what data is needed to support these things, uh, we can collect, we can pro provide it in a timely fashion. And the census allows us to have that framework uh, so that if the secretary or we want to study something new, like, as I said before, uh, what is happening to the bees, it allows me from the census of agriculture to know who are all the people who have bees in the country, which is a very small population. So then we can focus our data collection and our survey needs right to those individuals. And since we moved the census of agriculture over to the Department of uh, Agriculture, it has become the foundation for what we do. We do five year census. It becomes our benchmark of accounting for all the land in the country. We know what farmer or rancher is involved in what type of production type of activity. So that if we need to, in any of the interim years, go back and, and study like, oh, which farms are producing on-farm energy like uh, windmills or methane digesters we know which farms reported that in the census and can go back just to those specific farms to gather more detailed information. And we use that census and we use the foundation of that to be able to support all the programs that USDA requires during that interim five year time frame. And so I think it has been an, a fantastic move of integrating the two programs together. You uh, shared a little bit with us about your experience growing, growing up on a small farm. Can you talk about um, a little more about that and how that influenced your career? And did anything in particular tweak the young Joe Riley's interest in agricultural statistics? Well, I, I, I tell this story all the time. Growing up on a small farm, I learned uh, uh, very early in my life that that's not what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Uh, it did give me appreciation for what's involved in agriculture, uh, but it's something that I did not want to continue in, but I always was interested in it because that's where my family came from and that's what, you know, we always had, had, had roots in that area. So that, uh, and what I like about working for the National Agricultural Statistics Service, and the name sort of tells it, 
is that first of all, agriculture is a very prevalent in the name and it's before statistics. Our first mission is to, is to serve agriculture. And almost everybody in uh, my agency right now, they all grew up on farms. 90% of our staff, that's where we all started. Now we're not farmers now, but we all have that appreciation and love for what was involved in dealing with agriculture. And then you use your mathematical or statistical skills in providing good quality data uh, back in the service of agriculture. As I mentioned earlier, I started my career, you know, back at the Bureau of the Census. And during the course of my career, I worked on, you know, providing data on the unemployment rate, uh, on manufacturing statistics, crime statistics, health statistics, population statistics. And all that is, is fine because I used my mathematical and statistical skills that I developed through, you know, college and, uh, and all that. But it wasn't until the time that I was able to marry the two together, you know, and really look at how I could use the skills that I had developed, you know, statistically, and see how they actually provide some service back to the agricultural community. Because that's where I think myself, and if you were to interview many of the staff members that work in, in NAS, I think that's where, uh, why all of us are so passionate about what we do, because we know directly how our data is important to the farmers. If you want to buy land, you have to have good financial information to show the financial profitability of your farm operation. A lot of them will use data that we've provided to show how they can compare or contrast to other typical uh, entities that are, are in their same sort of market niche. Uh, you see how our information uh, uh, supports the crop insurance program, which is critical to this country. So if you didn't have the data to support a good active crop insurance program, what would happen to people in times of, of disaster, as I talked about before? Uh, we keep a fair and open market in place. Uh, farmers now uh, understand they're not just reliant like, well, what should I sell a bushel of corn for? By having a sound economic system in place, everybody knows what the production is going to be and what the price should be, and it's fair and open to everybody else. And then we're starting to look at the trends. I mean, we study things now on conservation, of how to keep things sustainable in the future. Uh, and farmers are using our information to see what different practices are across the country. Uh, as you know, we were talking a little earlier before we started this interview about the look of certain practices such as with uh, cover crops and using no-till and things like that. And more and more, we're seeing that adoption rate of farmers across the country. And again, everybody looks for data to support that whatever business decision or, or farming decision they made is, is practical. And the more that they say, you know, oh, okay, here's how many farms are using this type of conservation practice and look at how economically viable they are. Why don't I look at the same thing and look at the cost uh, impacts that this has? And that's where our data really helps, you know, supporting agriculture. So when you look at it, uh, in my career, it wasn't until I could really blend the mathematical statistical side to really seeing how it serviced agriculture. And I think, you know, I think within the Department of Agriculture, we're lucky in that respect, uh, that we see the direct link of the data that we produce and how farmers and the American public, you know, really rely on it. Well, as we conclude this interview, are there any other um programs, decisions, experiences you'd like to share with us? A couple things. Uh, uh, and there's a couple issues that I'm dealing with now that are very fundamental for the future of statistics in general, and especially agriculture statistics. Uh, one is that we rely on the voluntary cooperation of the farmers and ranchers out there to provide us data. Uh, our response rates and our cooperation continues to decline. Uh, I think it's part of society uh, as a whole. We're all busy. We're all busy doing a lot of things. I think there's a tremendous voracious appetite 
for data. People want more and more, and yet the number of farms continues to shrink a little bit, so we're putting a tremendous burden back on the farmers out there to continue to provide this uh, data. And I, I think that one of the challenges for uh, NAS and my agency is to look ahead in the future of how can we, you know, satisfy that appetite for data that is necessary and not overburden the farmers and ranchers with the surveys that we're doing out there. We have to come up with new technologies, new ways. It's going to be exciting. Uh, just to give you one example, you know, uh, one of our primary ways that we've been able to collect data efficiently is that I would call you up on the phone and ask you a few questions. Well, how many people answer the phone now if they don't recognize the name and number that appears on the phone? That didn't even exist a few years ago, you know. So now we're faced with the difficulty of data collection uh, just dealing with this new um, mobile government that, and, and society that we have, that we have to figure out ways of, uh, of looking at that. So, you know, we're looking at new exciting things. Uh, we use satellite imagery quite extensively to see if we can measure, you know, the production of crops and, and things like that. That helps for crops uh, quite a bit. It doesn't help as much for chickens that are in a poultry house or things like that. You still have to be able to get inside to, to figure out how many are there. So uh, we have a challenge of figuring out how to satisfy the data needs in the future without burdening our farmers and ranchers and how to provide quality data, you know, if we are experiencing some uh, uh, diminishing uh, response rates. The other thing that is a, a major concern for us in the future is being able to provide the data security and integrity of protecting the data once we collect it. Uh, we're all dealing with cybersecurity threats, things like that. Uh, but yet, we have a pledge to maintain the privacy and confidentiality of the farmers and ranchers of who provides us the data. Uh, we have one issue now that we're dealing with is a, a great concern to me as I, as I leave my career here at NAS, and that is that in the uh, uh, appropriations bill last year, they passed the uh, Cybersecurity Enhancement Act of 2015, which now, for the first time, allows the Department of Homeland Security to have access to some of the confidential data that NAS has collected from its farmers and ranchers. All in the interest of national security and be able to protect yourself from cybersecurity uh, threats, but the perception of how the American farmer and rancher are going to think, I've given you a pledge for the last 100 years since the department has been formed in 1862 that no one else can see this data or have access to it. And now another department has access to it. And just, I know it's all in the interest of security in the country, but explaining that to farmers and ranchers and making sure they're aware because there is a concern over there of maintaining the privacy and maintaining the confidentiality, yet addressing the new world that we're living in that you have to guard against these cybersecurity threats and that how to blend those two together and still get the American public's cooperation is something that I think not only NAS as a statistical agency but statistical agencies in general are going to have to address in the future. Good. Well, thank you very much for thank sharing you. your history and your legacy. Thank you. Thank you.